So our meditation on the Sermon on the Mount continues from last week. And just to recap, last week we entered through the doorway of the Beatitudes. We were in a state of objective spiritual need. We were the spiritless, the powerless, and the weak at the mercy of a cruel, sinful world. Yet in Jesus, people such as us become the blessed ones. Why? Because Jesus has come to give us the things we lack, a new spirit, a new heart, and the power of hope in him and his work. And we learn that when this occurs, we begin to live as different people, transformed into people of mercy, with pure hearts, and of peace. Now, of course, not perfectly, but like newborn children, in this new life that has been made for us, we begin to do the things of this new life. Well, today, Jesus' description of his disciples continues. And maybe some of this stuff sounds like old news to you, but imagine Jesus is saying some things that are really radical. He's describing a group of people unlike other disciples that anyone has ever seen and a relationship with him that isn't rabbi and student, but of worshiper and follower and savior. So now he's going to describe to us what these transformed individuals are like, but he's not going to describe them as individuals like he did in the Beatitude, but rather as individuals that he now will use to transform the rest of the world into his disciples. And so he starts with a couple of images that I shared with you in the children's message a little bit earlier. He starts with the image of salt and the image of light. Now salt is one of the most useful things in the ancient world, especially and even still today. It's used to preserve before you had refrigeration. It was used to uh, make something taste good that tasted bad. And I'm sure the options for the types of food that you could eat were never as plentiful as they are now. But what does it mean to be the salt of the earth? Obviously, it's not something silly like I shared with the kids. I'm not going to give you guys all a bag of salt when you leave today, and you're going to go around and try and sprinkle all the earth with it. Right? Nor did you get one when you were baptized and said, all right, here's your Christian bag of salt, now go be the salt of the earth. The children were right that salt is being used here as a metaphor for something that enhances or brings to the table, pun intended, the thing that is missing. And that is what the disciples of Jesus are called to do, to bring the thing that is missing into the world. Then he says, Jesus' disciples are that which bring light to the world. But what does that mean? Obviously, I'm not going to hand out a bunch of flashlights because, one, you'll probably just shine them in each other's faces, but two, that's not really what this is talking about. It's not talking about a literal light that we're going to use to shine in a dark room, nor is it asking us to hand out lights to our neighbors, nor is it asking you to go out and start a company that makes lights where you're going to illuminate all the streets and the town that you live in. Although we'll come to see that if that is your job, you actually are going to be bringing light to the world, but not quite in that way. See, light is used here as a metaphor. It brings to mind the thing that reveals truth. It helps us see things as they really are. It reveals what was once hidden in darkness. And light's only as good as its perch, so to speak. As I demonstrated with the kids, if I turn a light on and then I put it on the inside pocket of my suit coat, it's not very useful anymore. But how does this all work? What does it look like? How am I actually salt and light in the world? Well, the first thing that you need to realize is that it isn't you that's salt and light. But that thing which now is in you 
namely the thing that Jesus brought that you lacked himself. Jesus coming to live within you, to bring a new spirit and a new heart, is what makes you that which is the light of the world and the salt of the earth. And how does he do that? Practically speaking, we have a doctrine that has been termed vocation that explains how this works. In your vocation, whatever it may be, it could be the earlier referenced light company manufacturer, where you have both the literal and the figurative outplaying, or it could be any other thing under the sun. You see, in Luther's day and age, in order to be a holy person, you had to work for the church. Those were the only holy vocations. But through the Reformation and the revelation in God's Word, Luther came to reject that because, after all, the mission of the church is to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching. And it's hard to do that when all the Christians are in aloof cloisters up on hills and rarely interacting with the very people they're sent to witness to. And so Luther's doctrine of vocation says that you are the salt and light of the world in the very job that you now work in, in the very neighborhood in which you now live, in the very family in which you are in. How do you know that God has called you to those people? Because that's where you are. And he's given us many and varied gifts to carry this out. As Jesus' disciples were called to live extraordinary lives, in the midst of ordinary jobs, places. And we're going to begin to see as he goes on what those extraordinary things are. And they're certainly not extraordinary in terms of the world. But even with all of that, you might still be wondering how exactly you do this. And where are we going to get the introduction? And this is where we're going to get the introduction that answers this today in a moment. But before we move to that, I want to stop right here and address some of the countering voices that have occurred in your head. The countering voices that arise naturally in a sinful world and among a sinful people after we've heard the wondrous news of the gospel that it's all been done in Jesus and that now you are the salt and light of the earth. So one voice is a voice of pride. It's all up to me now. I'm the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Jesus said so. So nothing can stop me from being a holy and righteous person. I'm going to go out and I'm going to do all of these things. And because I do them, many people will come to know Jesus. That's true in a certain sense, but not in the way the prideful person thinks. You're going to fail to obey what Jesus asks you to do. Time and time again. It isn't about you. And he isn't getting rid of the law as he's going to share with us in a moment. But what he's done is he's freed you from being justly accused and condemned by that law. So that you now are free because of the work that he has done. And he is going to use you. And he's going to work through you. But the voice of pride says it's me that does those things. And it's dangerous because, one, it gives glory to you on the one hand, and on the other hand, it will inevitably crush you under the weight of your failures to live up even to your own expectations. Another voice is false humility. He can't really be talking about me. It doesn't really matter what I do. I'm just little old me. There are others better suited for being the real salt and light of the church than I am. I'm damaged goods because of my past and the bad things that I've done. Or I can't really speak very well, if you remember Moses in the Old Testament. I don't know many things. I can't articulate very well what Jesus is saying, so he can't really be talking about me. He is talking about you. Every single one of you, you are the salt and light that he's speaking of. Now, you're not going to manifest those things in the same ways, and that's where the doctrine of vocation lets us know that sometimes 
When you're a kid, it's going to be obeying your parents and honoring and cherishing them. It's going to be getting along with your siblings, loving them, caring about them more than yourself. Talk about training in righteousness. If you're a parent, it's going to be caring for your children and sharing the message of the gospel with them, reading the scriptures with them, praying with them, taking care of their bodily and earthly needs. At your work, maybe you're a lawyer or a doctor or a nurse or a teacher or a janitor, whatever it may be, you can be a mask that shows God in all of those places. So false humility doesn't work. And then there's the voice of fear. But what if, what if somebody knows that I'm a Jesus follower? What if they find out that I disagree with their lifestyle choices or that I disagree with what they think about what's good and bad? What are they going to say? People won't like me. I want to be liked. Isn't that exactly the thing we are supposed to bring? If we're the salt and light of the earth, and all of that comes from the thing that Jesus gave us, which we lacked, if we hold him back, we do nothing. This voice needs to be addressed with serious prayer. Because the difference in you now that Jesus has redeemed you and is beginning to regenerate you into something new is the very thing that makes you salt and light. It isn't us. It isn't you or me. It is Him in us that makes all the difference. If we cover Him up and hide Him away from others, we turn away from Him. We cut ourselves off from Him, and then that is where we are in trouble. This isn't a reference to a failure to act in situations or having a rough week or spending time distracted. This is in reference to a rejection of Jesus as Lord and Savior. But Jesus himself addresses probably one of the most pernicious voices that arises out of a response to hearing the gospel. Because once you hear the gospel, it's not like the devil stops his work. It's not like your sinful flesh hangs it up and goes home. They're still trying, as they might, to get you to hear what you want to hear rather than what Jesus wants to say. And that voice is apathy. I can't do that stuff perfectly. I might as well just give up. After all... God's done everything, so it doesn't really matter whether or not I do anything. Dietrich Bonhoeffer called this cheap grace, a trashing of the greatest treasure given to you by God. And on the contrary to what that voice tells you, if Jesus did what he says he did, then this matters more than anything else. What you say and do as a disciple of Jesus is now your most important task because you have the thing which the world lacks, namely Jesus himself, his word and his gifts. I have a really, uh, I like reading a lot of C.S. Lewis and in one of his books he has this scene that really stuck out to me where he has a character who's struggling against a character that's cast as the devil. And he's upset with God because of his limitations, that he's dealing with somebody who doesn't have to sleep or eat, yet he does. And he cries out to God and says, when are you going to send someone to do something about this? And the answer came back to him, I did. It's you. Often when we hear the gospel and the call to share Christ we think it can't really be that God is going to use me. But here he's saying that's exactly what he's doing. Jesus says here in verse 17 of our reading, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. It's as if Jesus himself is addressing this voice. He's just given you the greatest of all deals through the Beatitudes and up to this point in his sermon. 
that the weak, the spiritless, the powerless, you are going to be blessed in me because I'm going to do the thing which you cannot. I'm going to bring you the thing that you lack. And isn't it true that one of the human responses to something like that would be, all right, it's done. I don't need to worry about it anymore. But here Jesus says, don't think that I've come to get rid of the law. The law is still good. So good, in fact, that I have come to fulfill it on your behalf. So in one sense, it's true that you don't have to do anything anymore to save yourself from sin. For you have been saved from your sins by the work of Jesus. But he's not done with you yet. Nor is the work that he has come to do finished. For there are still others who do not know this joyous promise. And so now he intends that those who have been saved from the condemnation of the law now live according to it to bear witness to Jesus. To bring him the thing which we formerly lacked to those who still do not yet know him. The law and the prophets remain. The law is still good. And Jesus emphasizes this again with even stronger language in verses 18 and 19. For truly I say to you, which is always a linguistic indicator from Jesus, pay attention. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is serious about the law. And he continues to emphasize this throughout the Sermon on the Mount, as we'll see. And I would encourage you on your own time to read Matthew 5 through 7, and you'll see. Jesus wants you to do good. It is one of the ways he uses you, his disciples, to bless other people and share what he has come to bring, which all of us lack. But notice that even for those that struggle to do, they're still in the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't condemn them, for the law no longer condemns those in Jesus, for now they have his perfect righteousness. But rather, he encourages us not to listen to the voice of fear or pride or false humility or apathy that can arise from our sinful nature and from the devil, but encourages us to still do good in an effort to bring him to bear in the lives of more and more people. But then that's tempting to think that it is about us, right? i got to do things in order to be loved by God. I have to do things to be a worthy Christian. And so he addresses that again in the final verse. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I think we kind of read past that verse at times. So I want you to think about that for a moment. The Pharisees, they get a bad rap in the Scriptures. They're often at odds with Jesus. But no one can accuse them of not taking religion seriously. So imagine your life totally devoted to religious adherence. Every single decision, large and small, weighed and measured according to what you believe God's law teaches. How you spend your time, the place you work, how you raise your children, on and on and on. Every single aspect of your life weighed and measured in minute detail. You have to be more righteous even than those guys to inherit the kingdom of heaven. Now, of course, Jesus is saying this to illustrate that the law cannot save you. Your deeds cannot save you. There's only one way to have righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees. It is to be given 
as a gift by faith, the righteousness of the perfect Son of God, Jesus himself. Dear friends in Christ, you have been given that in Jesus. That's why the kingdom of heaven is theirs was not a future promise, but a present reality and a future hope. Because it already belongs to you in Jesus, and now he is calling us to live as if all those things are true. So you are that which salts the earth. You are that which brings the light to the world. Yes, you, really you. You aren't the source, the source is Jesus. After all, he was the thing that you lacked, the thing that you needed. By his grace and mercy, he now lives in you and works through you. The work of your salvation is complete in him. We aren't called to be salt and light for our own sake, but rather for the sake of those our Lord puts in our path. Jesus is who he said he was, the perfect Son of God, and he did what he said he would do, save his people from their sins. Now he is sending you, his disciples, to bring to the world the same thing that was lacking in each of us, Jesus and his righteousness. Let's pray. Dear Lord, you have called us as your disciples to follow you. Create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us so that we can go out and do the work of a disciple of Jesus in our workplaces, homes, neighborhoods, and wherever you lead us. At peace that you have saved us, help us to be inspired by your Holy Spirit to bring those same saving blessings into the world so that others may know you. In the name of Jesus, amen.